we've made it to your final album. This is uh, top five favorite albums of all time. Number five. Uh, this is Queensryche, Operation, Mind Crime. This comes out in 1988, same year as Injustice for All. That is a big year for you, my friend. Um, yes. Tell us about this album. So I'm going to be honest. This is the only album on the list that I had not listen to prior to this pre preparing for this interview it's the only band that i had never heard a single song from so perhaps i'm a little embarrassed to say that um but i remember in a previous interview with someone and i think it's chad saliga breaking benjamin black label society i believe he brought up the same band in his interview saying they're one of his favorites and one of his influences so two great drummers that love this album so there must be uh, some great drumming on here, which I know there is. Uh, why why does this stand out? And can you maybe paint a picture? I would say amongst the five albums you said, the other four are like globally well-known all-time great albums. And this one is more, you know, it went platinum. It was popular. It uh, super critically acclaimed, but it, it didn't have that massive worldwide sales numbers right. where everyone knows this album for our listeners that have never heard this album or never heard music from the band how would you describe the band's music as as well as this album for them to uh once the interview is done for them to go out and uh, listen to it in its entirety uh yeah uh well so queen's i mean started early 80s they i guess they they were known then as being um uh Obviously, the singer, he has got a really super high voice, um, kind of prog rock type of a band. Um, they had a few records leading up to Operation Mindcrime. This was their first, uh, their big concept record. So the, the album follows a storyline that they had made a, like a movie to as well. It was a, they're a band from Seattle, Washington. Um, and it, you're right, when this came out, it was the same time And Justice came, all for out, came out. Um, it, it didn't really do that well when this came out. It had its, you know, it, it had a loyal following, but not like some of the other records that it was a little, um, I think just because of the, the, the way GF Tate sings, <laughs> you know, it's not for everybody, but for me, this whole, when I mentioned this album on my list, this is all about uh, being a drummer record. This album taught me everything, uh, the foundation of everything that I, you know, went on to be as a drummer in both finger 11 and Santa Sonia. This kind of taught me everything. Um, this was made me the drummer that I am the kind of, and what I mean by that is the relationship between a drummer and a, the rhythm section, the bass player and the drummer, uh, Scott Rockenfield, the drummer of Queensryche and Eddie Jackson, the bass player of Queensryche, the way they play together always stood out to me. Um, they were, they were the first band that when when Eddie Jackson hits a bass, a, a note on his guitar, uh, Scott Rockenfield hits a his bass drum. So it's always like, do-do, 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 do They're always in sync together. And that was uh, just, I, I was so drawn to rhythm from that kind of stuff as a kid. And, you know, going on into my bands after that, Finger Eleven is what I, I would always try to get Sean and me to try to lock into that kind of stuff. I don't know if I ever referenced to them or on. I'm kind of getting this from Scott Rockenfield and Eddie Jackson from Queensryche, but that was always where it came from. Um, it just taught me everything about uh, a rhythm section. And just, it, it's just such a, kind of like Pink Floyd, the wall is also a story. Um, for me, this just, it was like, it was more mine where like you said, everyone knows Pink Floyd, the wall, when operation mind Cram came out, it was only a few select people knew it. Certainly most of my friends did not. And the people that did didn't like it. So it just felt like it was my record. So I was, I just learned everything, you know, creatively as a, as a drummer musician, I really picked up from that album, every single song, um, it, it, yeah I, I just can't I, it's just it's my favorite record of all time and I still when I put it on now and I show people I, it it's still an unknown enough of a record where I can show people and they haven't heard it so it's fun to play for someone and go hey check this out and you know there's a song Sweet Sister Mary on it the halfway through the record where they have these audio parts of 
this a woman's voice singing with their singer of the band um, back forth dialogue and just the musicianship on on it it's like every time Scott Roggenfield is is playing the bass player is playing the same thing with him and it's just I don't know I always locked into that and it just became the basis of you know everything for me as the drummer after that you know so um it, it it's one of those records that's not for everybody but man for me it's like it really shaped me as a drummer yeah so there's uh there's two hit singles so there's eyes of a stranger and i don't believe in love these are like breakthrough hits on billboard and uh you mentioned the album didn't like explode out of the gate it was like a slow burn and over time it's eventually gold eventually it's platinum and uh <laughs> it's funny i listened to this I remember, so this is a few days ago, I listened to this at the gym. So I'm like pumping weights and I'm listening to this album in its entirety. And I messaged you. I was like, dude, I'm so impressed with this album. Uh, it's it's hard enough to just put out an album with say 10 great songs, just to do that is hard. And yeah. then here you have, um, you have a whole story with characters and concepts and not just, you know, say 10 great songs, but you have... 10 more than 10 i don't know 14 great songs that all have to work in order to tell a specific story so right. it's it's like somehow they have to flow into each other so you can't have like four ballads in a row so whatever right. you're writing you have to be aware that this song would actually go here in the story like mm -hmm. i give i give it so much credit for having such a grand vision and actually following through with it and delivering results that are a masterpiece like this. So I was super impressed. Yeah. And I, I texted you. I'm like, dude, this is awesome. Like, how did I miss this all these years? I know you're like, man, this drum sounds killer. This snare drum's cracking or something like that. You said, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it yeah. is such a great sound. Yeah. So I actually have, uh, I have a, a picture here that I want to bring up. So we dug up a picture here. Can you see this on the screen? Yep. Awesome. So for for those watching, so uh, people just listening are not going to see this, but those watching this on YouTube, uh, who is this guy that you are hugging? What is going on here? That's Jeff Tate, the singer of Queens Um, and this was uh, the last tour I did with Disturbed uh, when I was playing with Saint Sonia. This is one of the last days of the tour, and I think in Seattle um, on the Disturbed Breaking Benjamin Alter Bridge. St. Asonia tour. Uh, so <laughs> the backstory on this, John, the bass player of Disturbed, uh, had done a side project with, with Geoff. And I don't even know if that's how I pronounce his name, right? Geoff Tate, Geoff Tate. I'm not sure. I'm just going to say Geoff Tate. Um, so leading up to that show, me and John, you know, are buddies and he, he was telling me different projects he'd been working on outside of Disturbed. And he's like, man, I'm doing this thing with Geoff Tate from Queen's Reich. And I was like, oh my God. I love that band so much. I, you know, I saw them front row on the Operation Mind Crime tour at uh, Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto and saw them on the Empire tour. And he's like, yeah, I mean, he's coming to the show, uh, you know, tomorrow night or the next night. He's going to come up and do a song with us. So this was in the catering tent at the at the amphitheater. So I guess when he arrived, John texted me right away. He's like, dude, he's over here right now. Come over. So as much as I kind of look like I'm, like feeling normal right there. I was in full on starstruck. I just finished telling him how, I, you know, I'd seen him front row and uh, your drummer gave me his drumstick from the front row and I was singing all your songs. And he was just kind of like, Oh, okay, man. Cool. dude. <laughs> nice to meet you. But yeah, I, I went on full fan fanboy mode with him. And that was uh seconds after that picture or before that picture was taken. That's awesome. That's good that, that they, they say, don't meet your idols. And in that case, it seemed like, it was a good dude. It was a good day for you. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, what's funny is there's, there's actually a Canadian uh, story behind this album and uh, oh. it's actually kind of dark. So I'm just going to read this real quick, which is cool. So you're talking about it being a concept album. Um, so the story follows Nikki, a drug addict who becomes disillusioned with the corrupt society of his time and reluctantly becomes involved with a revolutionary group as an assassin of political leaders. So that's the concept of the album. And check this. The idea for the album came from Jeff Tate. So the guy we just saw in the picture after moving to Canada and listening to the 
the, the talk of members of the militant Quebec separatist movement who had grown friendly with him, some of whom were in organizations which engaged in bombing and terrorism. So there's a there's a Quebec Canada uh, history huh. behind behind this album, which is pretty cool with us uh, Canadians here. So. Wow. Well, I, and I can certain certainly relate to the uh, the drug addicted dude as well. <laughs> I know yeah. one of those guys. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and and the singer Jeff actually there was a bunch of resistance, so he came up with this concept, and none of the other band members were on board, and apparently he had to one by one, like isolate each member and just with one member convince them and get their approval, and then over time, uh, they were other people were outnumbered, and eventually they all came on board, and and. Uh, but I guess it wasn't easy to explain or have other people buy into that vision. And it's, it's a good thing that he stuck with it because of the album that we got. Classic album. I love Queens, right? Um, and you know, empire, the record that came after that and the album before that rage for order, um, uh, are two of my favorites too. And they, they did one more, I think, a album called promised land after empire. All those records are super important to me, but they're just one of those bands that, um, with his style of singing it became kind of you know it wasn't everyone's cup of tea um which i understand but i mean metallica brought them out that whole injustice for all cycle metallica had queens opening for them on that tour across throughout america so they were respected it just it kind of took uh that album didn't do as well as they hoped and then when empire came out they actually when they were able to headline arenas on their own they went back and did that whole record in its entirety, but it was like an album too late. So they would come out and play all the hits from Empire, you know, Empire, Jet City Woman, all their old songs. And then at the halfway through the show, they go backstage, change the whole stage and they do the whole Operation Mindcrime record in its entirety. But they kind of had to do it a record after, you know, so but it was cool. man. I saw it front row and it's awesome. So you you were too young in 1988, but you were mentioning that Metallica brought them out on tour. You could have heard your two of your five favorite albums played in in their entirety uh, at the same time if you were old enough in 1988. Well, well, no, I tried. They played a Cops Coliseum in Hamilton, uh, the Injustice for All tour with Queensryche opening up. I tried. I, my parents wouldn't let me go, but I was I was very well aware that the show was going on. I just. I don't think I could go without my big brother at the time and we didn't get tickets. So you were already a fan at that point. Okay. I didn't know if it was like in retrospect that you got into those albums or it was. Oh, I was into it then, yeah. Okay. Okay. And, and there's actually a sequel to operation mind crime. There's uh, the second one. Is that true? There is. Yeah. Um, I don't Not know. The same? I'll leave it that. Uh, I love the first one. I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> All good. So uh, a few points about that album, then we'll wrap up. So uh, again, I just I love seeing the retrospective reviews. I love seeing what p- critics thought of the albums at the time, especially if they say something clever. So a uh, rock hard reviewer remarked that the music featured clever breaks, unusual song structures and ingenious arrangements, uh, which was an unmistakable sign that the band did not aim to the taste of the masses, but primarily wanted to publish intelligent, artistically demanding albums. So that's a good, uh, a good synopsis. Uh, Kerrang! Magazine had it at number 34 on the 100 greatest heavy metal albums of all time. So that's wow. awesome. And uh, last thing, the, the song I Don't Believe in Love was actually nominated for a Grammy Award for Best Metal Performance. So Grammy nominated wow. band right there because of the album. And last but not least, uh, Avenged Sevenfold, who went on to se- sell millions, as well as Dillinger Escape Plan, uh, have both cited Operation Mind Crime as being big influences on their career and their music. Oh, cool. Neat. 